This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Kindness. We see it all around us. We see it when someone pays for someone else's coffee or holds the door open for another person. We see it in the smallest of gestures, like a smile or a kind word. But it's different when we turn on the news or social media. Oftentimes, what we hear about, what outlets are pushing, is the opposite of kind. Welcome to the Kindness Matters Podcast. Our goal is to give you a place to relax, to revel in stories of people who have received or given kindness, a place to inspire and motivate each and every one of us to practice kindness every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kindness Matters Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rathbun. And before we get into our show today, let me remind you that the Deluxe Edition Network has a podcast of the month section. And this month, there are two. First up is Friends Talking Nerdy. It's a podcast hosted by Professor Aubrey and Tim the Nerd, that delves deep into all things geeky and nerdy. With their passion for pop culture, science, mental health, and technology, the hosts offer insightful commentary on the latest trends and happenings in the world of geekdom. Through their engaging banter and lively discussions, Professor Aubrey and Tim the Nerd create a fun and informative space for all nerds to come together and explore the latest trends and ideas. Join them, won't you? Also up this month is the podcast Films and Fermentation. It follows three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting shit-faced. Your hosts, Kevin, Mike, and Leo, discuss various movie topics in conjunction with their favorite libations. It's a podcast about alcohol and cinema. Cheers! Look for both of these shows at deluxeeditionnetwork.com forward slash Podcast of the month. And now, on with the show. My guest today is, she's so awesome. She is so much fun, and we've spoken together a couple times. And I just want you to meet her too. Um, She is a social worker and the founder and, and CEO of No Place Like Home Senior Services in Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome to the show, Irene Brooks. Thank you for having me, Mike. Oh, it is so good to have you here, Irene. Um, we and and we've been talking a lot. I, I just did a show with a with another person who works in the same industry as you do. She is she is one of the persons that goes to the homes. But yes. this notion, I heard, I heard her show. She's she is great. She's one of my people. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. It's like, if you're ever in North Carolina and need a job, hit me up, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that was Don. But but I'm really fixated on this notion, this idea that seniors, the elderly in our communities, really need more kindness. And, And you have come... To answer that call um, with your with your business, but let let's start from the very beginning. As Mary, oh, I, that wasn't Mary Poppins. That was that was the sound of music, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, let, I think so. Let's start at the okay. okay. Anyway, <laughs> it's late in the week. You can tell. So you you started off your career though as a social worker, correct? So so yeah so yes and no. Um, I went, well, I got my degree in social work and wanted to be a social worker from the time that I was a small child. My mom said, you don't want to be a social worker. Social workers are poor. And (laughs) so they're what? They're poor. I have no. Oh, okay. And the fact that, um, in where I'm from originally, which is New York, um, social workers pretty much get put their lives in their hands every time they go out. It's a pretty dangerous job. So she was really concerned about that. Um, So I went and got my degree. It was something that I always wanted to do, but I listened to her and went into business. I went into marketing and advertising. 
And then it never left my heart. So I decided I was going to go into social work and I did that for several years. Okay. And so that, but you eventually found your way to working in the field that you, that you're currently in. Is that correct? Yes, yes I did. I did. What drew me? Nope. Go ahead. Um, Originally, I was working with families and children because that's the kind of social work that I was um, that I would see growing up, Um, you know, social workers coming and helping families. And um, so I started doing that. And then my dad got sick and actually both both of my parents got sick. Same month, same year. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. We. um my mom had congestive heart failure. My dad had end stage kidney disease, and he had uh, was diagnosed with dementia. So it was a can of goodness that happened all at once. Uh, oh my gosh! How do you? I mean, because it, it's hard enough when one parent is is ill or or needs help, but how do you do both of them? Um, very badly in the beginning. <laughs> um, I thought as a social worker, I had all the tools that I needed to equip sure. me with the, for the job. And the reality, Mike, was that it was so much harder than I ever thought that it would be. Um, you don't know what you don't know. So, right. you know, kind of like parenting you don't it doesn't come with a manual well taking care of your parents doesn't either yeah, that either oh wow um so but now did are, are your folks still with us my mom is my my dad passed um four it's going on four years ago um, okay but we you know i was able to take care of him till Till the last days, um, and he died peacefully at home. That's um, that's yeah, the best we can hope for, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you know w- what I learned? My biggest lesson really was that being a caregiver was a really lonely process. It's you, you're confused. You don't know what to do, and then you really don't have anybody to navigate. Um, help you, you know, say, call this person, do this, look into that. So I, I kind of made a promise to myself that when all was said and done, that I would become that to other caregivers. Nice. Yeah. Because caregiving is, it's not easy. Um, and I don't, I don't speak from a lot of experience. I mean, I, I was with my mom when she passed. I mean, she was released to to her home in hospice and she had a a hospice nurse, but she was on vacation. That hospice nurse was on vacation on the night that my mom decided to pass. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and I, I mean, I knew we had the meds that we were supposed to administer, right? And I didn't know how much. I didn't, I'm like calling on the phone. I'm like, she's calling out for my dad. She says she's dying. They're like, that's normal. It's okay. You know, give her cc's of this and she should calm down. And I'm like, okay. But yeah, it's, it's incredibly lonely and difficult when, when you're now, do you have siblings or were you? So I have one older brother um, and and his wife, and they were, you know, as, especially his wife, you know, very loving and caring. And in fact, in the beginning, we split, like, you take care of dad, I'll take care of mom, like as far as um, juggling all the doctor's appointments and things like that, because there was, yeah, there was a time that we would a have lot. three and four at, in one day. So, so we kind of split duties on, on that. Okay, um, well, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So my mom got better and she's, you know, she's home. We live in the same neighborhood. Um, my, my dad declined. So I ended up having to 
take care of his dialysis. He refused to go to the dialysis center. So I had to learn how to do dialysis um, at home. Oh my gosh. And yeah. And that's a, that's a big job. Um, it, it was a lot of responsibility. What does that involve even? I mean, I know what so, dialysis is, but. Yeah. So the kind that he had was called PD. Uh, the, the actual words are really long, so I can't remember. Um, but they put, right, they put a port in the stomach area. Um, and you have this machine that does the dialysis all night. So at seven o'clock at night, I would hook him up and then come back. He would go all night. And then in the morning I would go and unhook him. Um, okay. And as he progressed, there was times that I had to go twice, you know, like when I got off of work and when, you know, before he went to bed. So it's just, it just really got very time consuming. And wow. Mm -hmm. I, I did not even know you could do dialysis at home. So it shows you what I know. <laughs> um, so now is this, is this what kind of drove you from just general ser social service work, um, social work to taking care of our elderly? Is that, was that kind of the, the driving force by taking care of your home folks? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was the thing where kind of, um, I wanted to honor my dad, um, in some way and what a way to honor him through a living, breathing, you know, entity that, that just helps others. Um, he sure. was the most generous man in the world and would, um, help anybody that needed it. So this is kind of a, a way to continue that. Yeah. Um, and I, I learned firsthand how many people there are with no support system, no family members that are local. Um, and they're doing things by themselves. They're trying to figure it out. And that's really hard. So yeah. I think I'm, you know, I'm able to help people with, with that type of uh, scenario. Sure. Now, do you find that, and basically, I mean, you can talk to this better than I can, but your work is basically sending helpers into a home so that the senior person or the elderly person can, can continue to live in the home instead of going off to a facility somewhere because they can do most things, right? Mm -hmm. Is that... Is that in a nutshell what, what you do? I'm sure that's simplifying it, but. Yeah, but no, it is. So studies have shown that um, being at home aging in place has better outcomes than than not. Okay. So what what we try to do is we try to help families keep their loved ones at home safely while they're able to continue with their lives. So I had to quit my job um, to take care of my family members. Sure. But um, with with our service, we're able to help people kind of keep their lives um, going while still getting their parent the care that they need and they deserve. We will be right back with my conversation with Irene Brooks after these messages from another Deluxe Edition Network member, the Graveyard Club Podcast. Are you looking for a place for all things horror and don't know where to go? Well, you've came to the right place, my friend. We are the Graveyard Club Podcast. For all your horror needs, visit us on YouTube and Spotify, and you can follow us over on Instagram at the Graveyard Club Pod. See you there. Yeah, because and it's it's such a pride thing, isn't it, for for older folks to be able to say, "Yep, I still live in my home. I'm in my castle, whatever they want to call it," and and, um, and you guys make that possible, and that's so cool. Right. So, now, but, go ahead. 
we, we go one step further because we know that sometimes being at home is not feasible. It no longer becomes safe. Um, so we will help people navigate through finding an appropriate place for them. Oh. Um, not all places are created equal. So, you know, you have all levels of care. You mentioned your mom lived in independent living for, yes. for a while. And so that's kind of like living in an apartment, but you have a whole bunch of folks and, you know, you do stuff and you have fun. And um, it's, it's a really nice thing to give you community. People need community. Um, Absolutely. But, but as you need more care, you may need round the clock nursing care. Well, we can do that. We can provide that. Um, but sometimes it, it may be cost prohibitive. Oh, sure. So, so, you know, we'll help you find the right place because not every place is going to be right for you. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Okay. But now there's another element here and I'm, I, I read about it on your, on your website. And now that I hear the story, I'm wondering, you are, you are also a certified dementia care specialist. Is that correct? That's probably not the right term. Nope, that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's a, a certified dementia practitioner. Um, and I do have a certification to specifically work with people with dementia. Um, you know, I learned from my dad um, that, you know, it's really hard to watch your loved one kind of turn into a different person right in front of your eyes. Um, right. You know, you can have somebody who is um, n the kindest, soft spokenest person in the world. And next thing you know, they're calling you names, names that never came out of their mouths when you right. were a kid. Um, no matter how much trouble you were in as a kid, they never said that. <laughs> that's exactly right. So it, that's, it's, it's, so hard, but you learn different things. You learn how not to argue. You learn how to redirect. You learn how to kind of go with the flow. Um, I remember making the mistake one time when my dad um, would ask to talk to his mother and his brother who had passed, you know, 20, 30 Yikes. years ago. Yeah. And I thought that the right thing to do was to reorient them and say, hey, no, they're they're no longer living. Well, the reality is, is that they're going to mourn that like if it just happened. Right. And that's what happened. I was like, oh, my gosh, I've made the worst mistake. So I made it a, a mission to learn everything that I could about the right way to be with that person with dementia but also save my sanity because if you sit with somebody and they ask you if you've eaten 17 times in a row, eventually you're going to say, Oh, I ate, stop asking me, you know, right. so I help my clients um, learn coping mechanisms to not say, stop asking me. Okay. So you're, you're teaching the family members, the caregivers about dementia. Is that correct? So, yes. So I work with the entire family. So my CNAs, my nurse assistants will go and they'll help the client with their activities of daily living, you know, bathing, eating, eating, toileting, that type of thing. But um, the person, the adult child or the spouse needs support too. So sure. that's where me being a social worker comes in and that extra help comes in. So I'll, I'll help them come up with coping mechanisms, different tricks, different things that they can do, um, as well as offer some respite time um, for them where they can go on vacation. Sure. Because, oh yeah. I, and I've never, I've never dealt with anybody with dementia, but geez, I wonder if I've told this story before listeners. I'm sorry if I have, my mom, prior to being diagnosed with congestive heart failure, um, was had a UTI. Mm. And we probably never would have known, except on Easter day, my brother called me up and he said, have you talked to mom today? And I'm like, no, I, I haven't called her yet. 
I was going to, but I hadn't. And he said, she thinks dad's still alive. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah. He, she said she can't find dad. So I was just like, I'm like, okay, I got to hear this for me. I called her up and I'm like, hey, happy Easter, mom. How are you? And and she said, I'm good. And we were just chatting. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, she said, I can't find your dad. Now, this is 2015. My dad had passed in 1992. Mm. So I'm like, and I'm like, we finished the conversation, lovely conversation, hung up, goodbye. And I reached out to everybody I know. And I have a friend who works for Boston Scientific. Mm-hmm. And I I wrote to him and I said, what do I do? How do I handle this? And he said, whatever you do, don't tell her the truth. Mm-hmm. Yep. Long, long, long story. So I'm not going to, but eventually I did have to tell her the truth. In order to get her to go to the doctor. Hmm. She refused to go. She absolutely refused to go. And and finally I said, look, mom, something's wrong. You think dad's dead or dad's alive. He passed in 92, you know, like 13 years ago or 23 years ago. And, and she kind of stopped and she looked down and she went, I knew that. I said, so now you see why I, it probably could have gone horribly wrong. Right. But I said, so now you see why we have to go to the hospital because there's something wrong. And so, yeah, sorry if I've told that story before. No, I I think that's a great illustration how it can go where they like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that. Or they can like, really, it can be like that first moment that they found out. You know, right. So I'm, I'm glad that it turned out well for you. Well, and again, this was not dementia. She did not. Ha- she was never diagnosed with dementia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it was mm-hmm. just she was having a UTI, and apparently, this can happen with those. Yes, absolutely. That's usually one of the things when somebody calls and says that their family member is acting weird or you know just doing and saying, "I'm like, uh, we need to get them sh- checked for UTI." Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so. I love the fact that this your whole business was was born out of your care for your parents, and I'm sure you probably think of your clients. I'm guessing that's what we call them, clients. Yep. Yes. As just an extension of your parents. Yeah, yeah. It's surprising how many. Um, people i'll see different things um i just left a a client's house that the gentleman has the same um uh same physical um ailments as my dad and he walks like him he can't see and you know it's it it was you know it's kind of like oh my gosh so i feel so so close to to this family yeah and so how do people get referred to you are there like children or spouses that say he or she needs more care than I can give him? And I'm, I don't want to put him in a home, but I can't watch him all the time. Is that how? Yeah. Yeah. I'll get people that find me online, but the vast majority of people come to me through um, the hospitals, EDs, where, you know, the person oh. has fallen or has had delirium due to UTIs or, you know, or, or starting to exhibit behaviors, the caseworker or the case manager rather will call me and say, hey, reach out to this family. They really need some help. Nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. Now, is is your care covered by Medicare? My I, I know generally, oh. yeah, generally not. Um, I do. Th- so it, it just always depends on the type of care that you're getting. Um, there are some insurance companies that will cover a certain number of hours of care. Um, okay. Long term care insurance, which a lot of people um, of the that age range that are coming to me now, they were able to afford long term care policies. But what oh. happens is 
they'll forget that they had it. And so I usually try to encourage can you check the kids. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Okay. So I, I'll tell them, look, look at, at the papers and see, you may have one that will, you know, pay a certain amount per day um, for care, for home care, as well as um, being in a, a assisted living or long term care. Yeah, I think one of the greatest things about what you do kind of alleviates a problem that I think we see. Well, throughout society, but especially in in older adults, is this issue with loneliness. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that there was a report last year, I want to say, and I don't remember who put it out, National Institutes of Health, CDC, Surgeon General, maybe. I don't remember. But basically, it said that loneliness has become an epidemic in the United States. And I think... Your service really helps with that. It, it really does. Um, and, and, you know, this is why I love my caregivers, because just like the young lady that you spoke to the other day, um, you kind of have, have to be a caregiver. This is not a job that you say, I'm going to try on, you know, uh, to see if I like it. It's, it, really, you, it has to come from your heart and soul. Um, and sure. the folks that I have, I, I remember I had this, this woman who was, she was at the end of her life. Um, and it was the daughter's birthday. Um, so my aides got together their own money, bought a birthday cake, a card and balloons for the daughter from the mom because the mom was so sad that she couldn't get her daughter a gift. So they went and did that. Like that was totally, totally, like they told me after afterwards. So it wasn't like they were saying, Hey, can you give us the money? They just did it. Right. They just went out and did it. Yeah. How cool. um, Yeah. Yeah. And, And that was so touching. And, you know, everybody had the feeling that it wasn't going to be much longer. So they, they really wanted to give them a special moment, some special time. And, sure. and how huge. Um, the way the, the woman passed away, maybe about a week, a week and a half later. So this really oh. was, yeah. I think life changing. You know what I mean? Sure. It, yeah. It the daughter will difference. remember that for the rest of her life, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, But, you know, we have people, unfortunately, that don't have family close. So they'll, they won't have anybody talking to them. They won't hear another human voice until our aid arrives to their home. Can you imagine going days and days without hearing another human being? No, I can't. Like having anyone call your name. Like, that's, it, yeah. it makes me emotional just thinking about. Um, yeah, somebody just magnitude. sitting in their house. And and so how, and I'm sure it's probably, it, it's based on their needs. But how often, on average, do one of your aides come to the home? It, it really depends on the level of care. So we'll do... Um, some companionship care where um, the person's really up and active and they're able to do their own things, but they're um, they need a little bit of extra support. Um, That can be three times a week, you know, two to three times a week. Then we have some people that are higher level of care that um, are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. So you have somebody that, so you're like, what, three, three people, a day in the house. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah. So I have a couple of cases now that are a um, 24 hour care and, and it's usually split between four people so that everybody, okay, four people. You know, nobody gets burned out. I was thinking three times eight, but be 24, but okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just so awesome. And I appreciate you so much, Irene, for what you do. And I hope, I hope if I ever get to that stage that, uh, that there's somebody like you in my, well, I'll have my wife. 
She doesn't know it yet. She's going to be my caregiver. <laughs> she thinks she's going to go first, but no. Um, no, I, I mean, just showing kindness by by being there to our elderly, our, our senior citizens. And they're so cool, aren't they? They have so many Thank stories. You. Oh my gosh, they are the best people. And I, I love that a lot of them have overcome having a filter. So they will tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <laughs> Whether you want to hear it or not. <laughs> That's exactly right. Oh my gosh. I, just, I get a kick out of that. That's so fun. Well, <laughs> I appreciate you, and I'm so glad that you could take some time to be on the show with me today. I really, really appreciate it. And that's uh, No Place Like Home Senior Services. You're based out of Raleigh. You serve Cary? I serve... Fuquay, Verena. Yeah, so I do Wake County, Johnston County, and Harnett County. That's that's okay. my primary um, area. Okay. If you know somebody who lives in those areas that could use a little extra help with their elderly family member... Um, give her a call. All of your information will be in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Irene. I really do appreciate you coming on today. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the time. It was great hanging out with you. Always. Take care. <laughs> Thanks. You too. What a fantastic show. I think almost, well, I mean, let's face it. All of us will probably be at some point in our lives where we will need a little extra help. And I only hope that there's somebody like Irene Brooks there to, to give us a hand, and uh, especially to our seniors, because Irene told me, and we didn't get to it in the show, but she quoted a stat that just blew my mind. She said that loneliness, persistent loneliness, is like smoking 15 packs of cigarettes a day to your body. And that just blew my mind. So thank heavens there's somebody like Irene Brooks out there and no place like home. And uh, yeah, fantastic story. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took away something from it. And that will do it for this episode of the Kindness Matters podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode. But in the meantime... Be that person who roots for others, who tells a stranger that they look amazing and encourages others to believe in themselves and their dreams. You've been listening to the Kindness Matters Podcast, and I am your host, Mike Rathbun. Have a fantastic week.